Who's your geek? Everybody has a geek, right? It's the person that you call when your computer doesn't work, or your network goes down, or you drop your cell phone in the bathtub. Even I have a geek, and I come from a long line of geeks. Everyone in my family was either a chemist or an engineer, a mechanic, or a tinkerer of some form or another. But the person I want to talk about today is my Uncle Ray. In 1984, my Uncle Ray sprayed WD-40 into the floppy drive of a brand new computer. <laughs> he was a mechanic, and he was my mother's uncle. So, uh, but my, my father actually manufactured these computers, and he brought two of them home, one for us and one for my Uncle Ray. And when he put the floppy disk into the drive for the first time and heard a grinding noise, he reached for the sprayable oil and completely ruined the computer. Now, there's something misguided about that, obviously, not terrible, but there's something actually admirable about that if you think about it. He, he saw a problem, he used the knowledge that he had, and he tried to fix it. And that's something I think we've lost in the last 30 years. Technology has moved really, really fast, and it's just hard for us to keep up. Technology, understanding people, has trumped people understanding technology. We've gotten to a point now where we have to hide any type of complexity. I had a CEO who loved to get all of us software engineers in a room and ask us, is software engineering an art or is it a science? And we would bicker back and forth, but eventually we'd all arrive at the same answer. It's both. Having a creative solution to a problem that you solve with technology. But with software, understanding people, it's more like sorcery or alchemy. It, you either get this stuff or you don't. You're either a wizard or you're not. That's the magic in the machine. We need to bridge the gap between what people believe technology can do and what it can actually do and encourage them to cross it. And I think one of the ways to do that is through metaphors. I love metaphors. I actually collect metaphors, and I've brought six of them with me today. Two on everyday things you do with your computer, two around internet and safety, and then two around opportunities I think we all have. So, let's start with everyday stuff. IP address and defragmenting. I can't really see you, but how many people have actually heard of these terms before? <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's probably one of my geek friends. Well, an IP address is an internet protocol address, a numerical label assigned to each device, computer or printer, participating in a computer network that uses the internet protocol for communication. Everybody got that? It's actually a phone number. So every time you connect a device to a network, it's given a very specific four-digit number, four series of numbers. And when it decides to talk to a server or another device or a printer or a computer, it knows what that number is, and that device knows what this number is. That's all it is. That's what an IP address is. Now, I know there are geeks in the audience going, hey, 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 now wait a second. You can't talk about IP addresses without talking about DNS. You can't talk about it without talking about DHCP. You can't talk about it without, no. <laughs> When a friend of yours asks you what an IP address is, it's a phone number. <laughs> it's not necessary to go into all of the other geek speak that someone asked about. So what's defragmenting? This is one of my favorites. Defragmenting is a process that reduces an amount of fragmentation by physically organizing the contents of the mass storage device used to store files into the smallest number of contiguous regions or fragments. I can't even imagine what that was like to read, much less for me to say. Well, defragmenting are hangers in your clothes closet. So your hard drive stores files, just like you store clothes in your clothes closet. Now, when you go through a week, you'll take articles of clothing off the hangers and you'll wear them and you'll toss them in the hamper. And then when you go to do laundry, you get all the laundry and you go back to hang it up. And what, what's going on? Like, you have empty hangers all over the closet, right? So what do most smart people do? They take the hangers out and they move all of the empty hangers to one end so it's really hang easy to hang their clothes up. That's defragmenting a hard drive. 
after a certain amount of time, after they've been adding and deleting files, you have all these empty hangers. And then when you defragment a drive, all of the things move to one end, all the empty space moves to one end, and you can hang your clothes up. Now this is, it's true, this is more, more for older hard drives than newer, but it's still kind of prevalent. So what can we do with these metaphors? <laughs> well, we can kind of alleviate some of the frustration we have every day. If you know what an IP address is, 80% of the time, 70%, and that's just an anecdotal number, it's because your device doesn't have an IP address that you can't connect to the internet. So when you get on the phone to talk to your cable provider about how you don't have internet, and the guy on the other end smarmily says, well, do you have an IP address? You actually know what that means. And you don't have to wait for the cable guy in that really awesome eight hour window to come by and basically <laughs> unplug and plug it back in because you don't have an IP address. Similarly, if you have an older computer and you're noticing that your files are getting written slowly and, or being read slowly, perhaps defragmenting is something you should do. That's the whole point, is knowing these simple terms. So let's talk about hacking. I love the term hacking, because there's good and there's bad, but phishing and an exploit. Who here has heard one of these terms before? All right, yeah, we've heard these terms. Okay, phishing. Phishing is the attempt to acquire sensitive information such as usernames, passwords, and credit card details by masquerading as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication. Sounds kind of like 007. Well, phishing, would anyone put their ATM in this ATM, ATM card in this ATM? No. It's got the right logo, right? Kind of, not quite. That's what phishing is. Most of the time you get an email with a strange email address that pretends to be from your bank. Or a website that doesn't have quite the right e address but looks right, like it looks like Twitter, but it's not the web address isn't quite right. See, computers are smart, but people are clever. And they can come up with things like this to try to trick you into typing your username and password somewhere that you really shouldn't. So a lot of the times when someone says they've been hacked, really, they've been phished. But by contrast, an exploit is a piece of software, a chunk of data, or a sequence of commands that takes advantage of a bug, glitch, or vulnerability in order to cause unintended or unanticipated behavior to occur. That sounds like a blue screen of death. Well, an exploit is what happens in large situations. Incredibly intelligent, brilliant individuals who know all these different kinks in the armor for very large systems and use them to their advantage. They exploit it. And it's just like the thermal exhaust port in Star Wars, right? The giant Death Star that could destroy a planet has one little chink in the armor, it's got one little hole that if you fire a missile, the whole thing blows up. And the guys in the Death Star didn't even know that that was there until they started the attack, but by then it was too late. So what can we do with that information? Well, we all have a personal responsibility to make sure our passwords are secure, to make sure we use two-factor authentication when possible, to keep, make sure that what, where we type is where we expect. That prevents phishing. One of the very famous hack jobs recently on a lot of celebrities that expose a lot of their photos, many experts believe was a case of phishing, having uh, passwords too easy to guess or details too easy to guess. Now by contrast, an exploit, some of these large corporations that have their credit card data stolen, that's not something you can that you can predict. That's something we as engineers can predict. But knowing that, you now know that a business that you're gonna do business with might not have the most secure software. But the only way you're gonna be able to tell is knowing the difference between those two hacks and who to hold accountable. A social network is a social structure made up of a set of social actors, such as individuals or organizations, and a set of didactic ties between these actors. Well, what is that exactly? It's one of those chemistry sets where the balls and the sticks connect together. Anybody ever played with one of those in chemistry class? Yeah. So basically, every person, place, or thing is a small plastic ball, and everything that connects them together is a verb, something that you've done. So if you're Eva up here, and you begin to like, comment, post, any of those actions that we take, you're slowly connecting yourselves to other portions of the graph, of the social network. And it's not just 
oh, I like this thing. The moment that you connect yourself to that other ball, it's connected to other balls. And suddenly those come closer to you and closer and closer. And things they've liked come closer and closer and closer. HTTP cookie. Who's heard of one of these? Yeah. So a cookie, also known as an HTTP cookie, web cookie, or browser cookie, is a small piece of data sent from a website and stored in a user's web browser while the user is browsing the website. Eesh. That sounds like someone's tracking you, right? And a lot of times that's exactly how it's described in the media and on, online and between people. So an HTTP cookie is actually a hand stamp to get into a bar. So when you go to a bar and you show them your ID and you pay your cover, they stamp your hand, right? You go in, you leave, you go somewhere else, they do the same thing. And then when you go to the third place, the bouncer looks at you and says, hey, have you been to those other two bars? You're like, no, I haven't. And you delete them, you erase them. But then when you go back to that first bar, the bouncer looks at you and says, I don't know you. Who are you? That's what an HTTP cookie is. It's a very simple small bit of code that identifies you to the website and allows them to, say, keep your username and password. So what can we do with this information? Well, if we know that a social network, as I connect myself to other portions of the graph and other portions of the network, like let's say I like John Hemingway, and a friend of mine also likes John Hemingway, but they've also liked John Steinbeck, well, that dot gets a little bit brighter and gets a little bit closer to us. And when we see a suggestion somewhere, that's why. It's not magic. So it's important that we be deliberate with what we connect ourselves to on all of our different social networks. And with HTTP cookies, well, people go and just delete them all the time, but then they don't understand why a website didn't remember them. And it's frustrating to go to the bank and have to type some giant long username when really they should just remember it. And most people don't realize that in your browser, you can actually choose which websites store cookies and which ones don't. So knowing these two things means you can bend these systems to your will. You can be deliberate and conscious and not think that it's magical, not be at the whim of other websites or social networks. You can take control. So, these six simple metaphors, defragmenting an IP address, can save you time, frustration, having to call your geek or your, or your kid in college or your dad or whoever it might be to find out like, what might be going wrong with your network. With hacking, phishing versus an exploit, knowing what these two things can keep you abreast of what's actually happening in the world. A politician can't just say, I was hacked, and blame some nefarious geek in some other country for posting a photo of something that he didn't think he was putting publicly. Versus an exploit, where you can hold a company accountable for not having secure systems. And opportunities. This is, these are things that you can actually use to your advantage, not just have websites take advantage of you. So, what I've done is I've taken all of these metaphors that I've collected and I've also gone to a lot of my geek friends and I've collected them at a website called Metaphoric Metaphorical Lee. And it's completely open source. So if there are geeks in the audience who, has a, who have a metaphor that they definitely want to add to the website, by all means, please go open a pull request. If there is a, uh, a term that you've heard before that's been said to you and you just don't understand what it means, by all means, tweet or go to the, the Facebook page or go to the website and open a task and I'll get a geek to answer it for you. Or I will. <laughs> so uh, I really want to share this type of information around and begin to really demystify these terms that we hear every day and often dismiss as geek speak. So, who's your geek? Well, for my Uncle Ray, I was his geek. And there was something that he always did that I only really began to appreciate until recently. And when he would call me, he would never ask me, Clint, how do I fix this? He would ask me, Clint, how does this work? And I would explain it but the moment that I would get super excited and go beyond what he was asking, because I feel like everyone wants to know everything, <laughs> he would say, no, 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 Clint, slow down. I don't need to know everything. I just need to know enough to be dangerous. I challenge all of you to be a little dangerous. When you're about ready to call your geek, think to yourself, 
how do I think it works? And then, when you call your geek and you get the answer to the question that you want, and they start sounding like one of these Wikipedia articles, just say as loud as you can, give me the metaphor. Thank you.